Well, thank you to our musicians and a big thank you to everyone that's contributed to children's ministry over the last 12 months at Lilydale. Wasn't that an amazing video? You realise how much work has been put in to making things continue to, to be there for ministry um, over this time. And I know it's not just children's ministry, but yes, I'd like to express appreciation to all of them. I've also worked out, you know how when you've got a fancy suit and you have one of those things there that sit in your pocket? I've worked out where they come from now, so they're just face masks. <laughs> well, today we begin a series in the life and the teachings of the Apostle Paul. And the more I have read and prepared and studied for this, the more excited I've got about it. Because when you come to the life of Paul, we find somebody that is truly a most intriguing character. But I don't actually want to start with Paul. I want to start with the word zeal. Zeal. You know, somebody who is zealous for something. Is zeal good or is it bad? You know, is zeal the key to live the life we should? Or is it a dangerous thing that will take us down the wrong direction? More than a thousand years before Paul was born, the Israelite people, who were not yet a nation, found themselves camped on the plains of Moab. The prophet Balaam is called by the terrified king of Moab and commissioned to come and curse the Israelites. Now, Balaam initially does the right thing and refuses, but there's great riches on offer, and so eventually he decides he will come and join the king in his quest to curse Israel. But... If you know the story, God intervenes and Balaam is unable to. He can't get the words out and he ends up blessing the children of Israel. So plan A has failed and now plan B is put into operation. And the Moabite women invite the Israelite men to come and join them in worship. And when we talk about coming and joining them in worship... Let's just suffice to say for um, the audience we have, this was a fertility religion where to join them in worship was a whole of body experience. There's no other way to put it. And so the Israelite men and the Moabite women come together in all senses. A plague breaks out. We understand plagues now. Moses instructs Israel's leaders to put an end to this and to punish the men who have joined with the Moabite women in this immorality. But instead of acting, they almost, you can almost see them taking a step back in the story and then there's this man, a leader by the name of Zimri. And this is the, what you could only describe as insurrection. Zimri takes a Midianite woman and takes her into his tent in full view of Moses and the whole camp. And it's, it's this, you know, if you're reading the story and it's the first time, you can almost cue the intake of breath as to, <gasps> what is going to happen now? Well, in the face of rebellion, where all the other leaders are frozen not knowing what to do, even though Moses has told them, Phineas enters the story. Phineas is the son of Eliezer, the grandson of Aaron, and Aaron, of course, is none other than the high priest. His father and grandfather, we have to say, and this is, I think, why it's included there in Scripture, his father and grandfather are gentle, kind men who are not given to being reactive or not given to fits of anger. So this is Phineas's heritage. 
But then we read in Numbers 25 from verse 7, when Phinehas, son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand and followed the Israelite into the tent. And this is my redacted version, my, my sanitized version. He followed them into the tent and he drove the spear through them. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped, but 24,000 died in the plague. It's a pretty grotesque story when you actually read it in all its gory detail. But Phineas, the point is this, Phineas is the hero of the story because he is the one that has the zeal to do what is right. Because of his zeal, Zimri and Cosby are now dead. Because of his zeal, the plague is stopped. Because of his zeal, he is given a promise that he and his descendants will be priests for Israel forever. His zeal is commendable because it represents faithfulness to God, loyalty. It is right. And this is where it becomes slightly confronting because this zeal that is ascribed to Phineas is exactly the same word that is ascribed to the Apostle Paul when he was persecuting Christians. In Galatians chapter 1, and you can look this up or it'll be on the, the, the screen, Paul uses exactly the same word. This is now Paul's first letter. And this is Paul writing about himself. And he says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. The zeal of Phineas is the self-same word as the zeal of Paul. And lest we think Paul just accidentally uses this word once, well, here we go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, he says. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. This is Paul writing about who he was before he knew Christ. And then as he writes in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10 from verse 1, he writes there and he says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that, that they may be saved. It's Paul's burden. He wants his, his fellow countrymen and women to be saved, to find Christ, to, to find what it is to know Jesus as the one of promise, the fulfilled one, the, the, the Messiah. And so he's praying that they might be saved. And he says, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. So there's this, <clears throat> this sense where zeal, when it's for God, may be one thing in terms of being good, but zeal in and of itself is not what will save us. His people, he was full of zeal, but it wasn't connected to truth, to the, to the right knowledge. And he goes on into Romans chapter 10, verse 3, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. That's what 
Paul lives and breathes and wants for us. Zeal is not right of itself. Paul wants his people to be saved, but zeal without knowledge is dangerous. And for Paul, it was on that road to Damascus that the zealous Paul met Jesus and with new insight and new understanding, his whole world shifted on its axis. Imagine what Paul's world was like, utterly different from ours, but some fascinating similarities, strangely familiar at times as well. In Paul's day, privacy was the preserve of the super rich. For everyone else, privacy wasn't a thing. The world was ruled by a dominant superpower. It was a world where warfare, plagues and persecution coexisted with wealth and privilege and power. In the world that was Paul's, the Roman Empire, anything was tolerated so long as you submitted to the emperor and participated in annual worship of Caesar, the emperor. The Jews had an exception, and the exception was given because they could not worship the emperor, but they had agreed that they would pray for the emperor instead. They had that exemption. They were jealous of that. There were many gods to worship. In, in you know, Roman society, the weak would fall by the wayside, the strong would prosper. There was this thing called Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. The Peace of Rome, ironically, was enforced at the end of a sword. Rome's military might made sure that there was peace, and if you didn't obey it, well, watch out. There was across the empire something like 80,000 kilometres of hard surfaced roads, Roman highways from North Africa to the Middle East to Great Britain. And for Rome, that meant they could project power and force quickly anywhere across the empire. And ironically, it was both this piece of Rome and the Romans' roads that assisted the rapid spread of the gospel once that started going out. God used those things. There may have been no electricity, no refrigeration, no combustion engines, no computers, no telecommunications, but they had the most amazing engineers. They could build aqueducts that brought water under pressure into cities. They could build theatres seating thousands that required no amplification and you could hear in every place in that theatre. They could build stadiums seating tens of thousands. And some of their magnificent buildings that still stand today were built without a single heavy machine or power tool. Life in Paul's day revolved around the family unit. Two, three, four generations would live together. Think about it, if you know, that was your reality, how would you go? Parents, grandparents, all in the same little house, sharing the common kitchen, maybe a common courtyard, and maybe that courtyard would be shared with a bunch of other people or extended family beyond that. Unlike our lives where we have often large houses and plenty of space, then work, worship and life were lived in close proximity to one another. Houses were small, rooms were small, streets were narrow, cities were, were much more compact. Life was lived close together. Everything you needed would be within walking distance. As for the gods, well, your choices were endless. You could have, if you went to the God of your choice, protection for warfare, power, wealth, health, love, pleasure, beauty, fertility, childbirth. You had the gods of the earth, the sun, the sea, the sky, the underworld, the gods of horses and cattle and grain and wisdom and mercy of luck and loyalty, strength, sleep, fame, fortune, justice, youth, freedom, virtue, truth, and that's just scratching the surface. You could choose your gods, 
There was a God for everything, but none of them really provided anything. They were transactional gods, not relational. They were gods to be feared and appeased and sacrificed to, but the gods were always distant. Jews were different. Jews, of course, obeyed the one true God at the exclusion of all else. To Jews, the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, was as much part of their life as breathing and eating. To protect themselves from idolatry, the Jewish people had rules, rules of separation from the Gentiles, rules of observance for the Sabbath, rules about food, rules that were obeyed or else. Yahweh was an almighty God, God most high, but few of them ever imagined a Messiah that would come as one of them with nothing in his appearance to commend him and would walk and live with them. Life in that Roman world was short. Life expectancy, about 25 years. If you took out infant mortality, then you'd probably, you probably might have a reasonable chance of making it to 50, but take out the infant mortality and you probably had a life expectancy into the late 50s at best. Think about how many that would take out today. About half died by age five, and of those left, another half would die by age 50. People married young, they had lots of children, population growth was strong through that era of Paul, but there were many ways you could die young. And the most common way to die would be of acute infectious disease, not our diseases of old age of today. Slavery was, was the norm. In Rome, conservative estimates say that at least 30% of the population were slaves. Think about that for a moment. One in three. You know, if we, if we divided our congregation here, down there, and said, right, that part of the congregation, all slaves. Sorry for this lot over here. <laughs> and the rest of you, buy them, sell them, doesn't matter. That's how it works. And that was the case. While the, the, the percentages varied across the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire is estimated at being anything from 40 to 100 million people, you know, think about the numbers, the millions that were trapped in slavery. The other interesting aside is that Rome, um, at its height, was the biggest city in the world, Rome itself. And it actually wasn't until the 19th century that the Western world had a city that was bigger than Rome had been at its height. It was impressive. It would draw people in. And that was Paul's world. Paul himself, he was either loved or hated by those around him, but you rarely find people are indifferent to him. He provokes a response. We actually don't know what he looked like, some take guesses at it, but that's kind of a modern curiosity. They didn't worry about that then. We know he was born in Tarsus, we know Tarsus was a, a significant city in modern-day eastern Turkey. It had strong philosophical schools, it had wealth, it had a substantial Jewish population, it was an influential city, not, not a nothing city. And it was here that Paul grew up learning to be a loyal, observant Jew surrounded by a corrupt city and world. He learned a trade while studying scripture. As a tent maker, he would have been skilled at tent repairs. Remember, there was no throwaway world at that point. If it broke, you fixed it. You would repair panels in your tent before you would throw it away and get a new one. He would make shop awnings and other sorts of shelters. Tarsus shaped Paul and prepared him, ironically, for life as a Pharisee. Today, as we reflect on who Paul is, we would say he was this amazing amalgam of a tradie, an academic, and a practitioner, all rolled into one. 
He could mix it in the workshop, the classroom and the home. His writings are theological but practical, complex but straightforward. They reach glorious heights of rhetoric and yet at times he seems reluctant to say what he actually wants to say. He bluntly confronts at times but other times, as I say, just you know, he's difficult to understand or, or he's reluctant. He's fascinating, he's energetic, but he, if he was here today, would have been intrigued, but probably he would have made us feel a little uncomfortable with the status quo. He is sometimes um, unable to find compromise at the cost of relationships, and yet he has this amazing love for the people he works for and with, and they love him in return. He's definitely not dull. And as an ambassador for Jesus, he changes the world. And once he's gone and those that knew him were gone, it's just his letters that speak. So what drove Paul? What, what prompted him to write his 13 letters, um, maybe 14 if you include Hebrews? Why did he say what he said? And so we've got to think of ourselves once we'd have said, look, we're a bit like the postman sitting in the post office, getting Paul's letters, steaming it open, having a read of his letter, trying to work it out. In, in reality, given the, the post doesn't work so well anymore, we probably should think of ourselves as hackers. We've hacked into Paul's email. We've got his letters to these people. We don't have their um, particular situation. So we're trying to discern by looking at his letters what questions he's answering, what wrongs he's correcting. Nothing seems off limits for Paul when you look at what he talks about. And whether he's on the road, under attack or in prison, his heart is filled with God and filled with love for God's people. His themes are many. And the two big themes are life in Jesus and the gospel, the glorious everlasting gospel. Life in Jesus, why that? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. But he deals with all these other things from end time deceptions and division in the church, relationships and sexuality and marriage and worship and death and resurrection and reconciliation. He defends the ministry. He talks about suffering and dealing with that. He, he talks about judgment and grace and leadership and every one of these ones, if we had time, I could read you a key text that would just like a spotlight shine on these themes. Today we live in an age of corporate surveillance. Privacy is diminished and Paul would have recognised that. For Paul, religion was never intended to be just an academic, intellectual part of life that's lived in private, in secret. Religion was, was something that people did, they lived and worked and worshipped together, it was who they were and if you changed your religion, you changed your life. Christians did not worship the emperor, they did not go to pagan temples or participate in that immorality. Jews who accepted the Messiah provoked their culture and provoked their fellow countrymen by accepting Jesus as the Messiah. To be a Christian meant everything about the rhythm and routine of your life changed. Everyone knew when you became a Christian. And so at the heart of Paul's letters, you've got these things that we cannot avoid, the glory of the gospel and life in Christ. Paul is not just creating a philosophical system or a theological construct, even though he does both of these things. What he is doing is seeking to create, to establish a new Jesus community, a new kingdom, a kingdom that was preparing people for eternity. And so he deals with things like, how should we live in the face of persecution, corruption, slavery, rejection, temptation? What sort of community should we be? What sort of people should you and I be? 
And Paul presents this recipe for this new community, this new Jesus community that will show Jesus to the world. That's why Paul can say, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because he is full of Christ. He's not just declaring the theory of the gospel, he is a living, walking, breathing example of the glorious good news of Christ and what it does. And when you lived in community with others, they could not help but see it. It's amazing when you think about it in those terms, because now it's not just Paul's sometimes complicated theology, it's actually Paul saying, this is how we live in Christ. Paul, who begins as a dangerous man of zeal, lost to God, stands there and gives approval when Stephen is stoned to death, drives him in his zeal to persecute the church, once confronted with Christ, is forever changed. A true zealot, says one writer, is utterly selfless. Paul was not a true zealot in the good sense of the word, until he knew Christ. And so, on the road to Damascus, everything changed. Confronted by Christ, he initially heads off to Arabia and Jesus remakes his world. As he returns to Tarsus, Jesus remakes his worldview as he rubs shoulders with Jews and philosophers alike while he makes tents preparing him for this uncomfortable and dramatic life. He becomes <clears throat> fearless and bold and brave and provocative and confronting and careful and loving, an example, an ambassador, a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. He writes to show what the community of Jesus is like. But he doesn't just... He doesn't just tell us what to think, he tells us how to think. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we take, every, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's what he tells us, it's how to think. In Philippians 4, 11, he lets us in on his secret, and if I can just have that water please. Philippians chapter 4, 11, <clears throat> I'm not saying this because I'm in need, he says, and I promise you I'm entirely healthy. <clears throat> Just sometimes the throat gets dry. <clears throat> um, Philippians 4.11, I'm not saying this because I am in need, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And Paul faced everything. In Christ, Paul assures us, we have nothing to fear. We can have that contentment. We can have what Paul had. Plagues may fall, wars may erupt, presidents and prime ministers may change, persecution may come, but we can be content no matter our circumstances. Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. He is my all. He is my everything. And so we started in Philippians 3, and I want to finish there. <clears throat> he says, and this is just after he's been talking about the misguided zeal that he had. And he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. I want to know Christ, he says, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this, he says. I press on to take hold of that which 
Christ Jesus took hold of for me. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward, straining, yes, toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. As Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As we go into this series with Paul, I want to invite you to take the journey with us. Get into the letters of of Paul for yourself. And when you come to Paul, you will meet the most contented man in the world. Why? Because when you meet Paul, you meet Jesus. Jesus.